Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris Potts. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Stanford Linguistics and Stanford in general, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second annual Light Forum. Uh, we have a packed schedule, so I'm not going to take up too much of your time. Um, I do want to emphasize, though, that I feel like we have a rare opportunity today. Um, we, just as it says in the conference title, we really have assembled a group of leaders from all areas of healthcare, technology, science, medicine, investing, industry, and so forth. Uh, and this gives us a rare opportunity to really explore the issues facing the industry from all angles. Um, and that, that's just an exciting opportunity. I, in my own life, I go to lots of conferences that are focused on natural language processing for healthcare. And I hear about lots of innovative solutions that people are developing and technologies that they're offering. Uh, and it's very exciting, but I do wonder in the back of my mind how those conversations would be different if we had in the room with us people who were shaping policy um, or working in the operating room uh, or in any area of healthcare. Uh, are the solutions that we're offering realistic? Will they have uh, uptake in the industry and so forth? It's often hard to tell. Uh, what's special about the Light Forum is that we have all those perspective as perspectives assembled, and that gives us a chance to really get a good grip, to really triangulate uh, on what the problems are and what steps we should take to solve them. Uh, and another amazing thing about this opportunity today is that since it is such an influential group, I think we can hope that our conversations turn into more than just conversation, that they make their way out into the world and really start to affect change in terms of policy and industry practices and how technology is developed and so forth. So I hope that we seize the opportunity. We've scheduled relatively few panels, and that, that means that each one of the panels is going to go really deep on its assigned topic, and I think that's wonderful. And if last night is any indication, this is gonna be a very intense day full of timely discussions. Um, I wanna emphasize that we want to hear from you as well, from you in the audience. Uh, last year, I think some of the most stimulating and provocative questions came not just from the panelists, but also from people in the audience. Uh, the moderators are gonna do their best to create time for that kind of audience interaction, so please do save up your questions. We really do wanna hear from you. Uh, and relatedly, it's a modern conference, so of course we're on Twitter. Uh, please do follow Light Forum 2018, that's the username, and you could also use Light Forum 2018 as the hashtag, uh, those are all one word, uh, to participate in the discussion that way. And I think that's another great way to ensure that the conversation we have makes its way out into the wider world. Uh, and relatedly, also just for conference navigation, I want to emphasize that there's an application. Of course, here we are in Silicon Valley, there has to be an app. Uh, so please do download the app, and if you have trouble with it, there's a help desk outside, and somebody can help get you set up. Uh, okay, so just by way of wrapping up, uh, I want to thank our sponsors, um, UPMC, Stanford Linguistics, Rome. Without, without their contributions, we would have, I guess, a whole lot less AV equipment all around us. Uh, I think without Morgan Stanley's contributions, we wouldn't have had such a nice breakfast today. Um, yeah, uh, and I also, of course, I won't go into the long list of thanks that Alex gave, la gave last night. There'll be more chances for thanks later, but I do want to just quickly thank this, the staff in Stanford Linguistics. They devoted a lot of their time to making sure this happened, and of course to Akilah Zafar at Rome. Without this, without that group's efforts, I guess not only would the AV equipment not be in the right place, but none of us would quite know what to do, and we'd all be sort of milling around. Um, so without them, none of this would happen. Um, just by way of wrapping up, so we're going to turn now to a video from a very special virtual guest, and I guess that'll be another way of kicking things off and emphasizing again the, the kind of global reach that this conference can have. So thank you and welcome. Big round of applause to get it going. Good morning. I'm Congressman Kevin McCarthy from Bakersfield, California. I apologize I couldn't be with you in person as I was last year. Congress is in session and voting this week. However, I wanted to say a few words about why the Light Forum is so special, as is the work being done by its organizers, Rome Analytics and Stanford Linguistics Program. As we all know, healthcare is an enormous part of our economy. With the rise of technology, and particularly artificial intelligence, there is a real opportunity to improve outcomes for patients while bending the cost curve. 
The light form is focused exactly on this innovation. This is exciting for the problems it solves and for the exceptionalism it demonstrates. Exceptionalism that is unique to the American economy. The two partners that put the light form together, Rome Analytics and Stanford Linguistics Program, are perfect examples of what makes America so special. I remember being introduced to Rome over a year ago, and it has been an extraordinarily to see the dynamic startup move from an idea to a critical player in the healthcare space. Now, obviously, as a California, I'm proud of how creative our Silicon Valley companies can be. And Alex and his team are exactly the type of success stories we want to see more of. But none of this success would be possible without Stanford University. Not only did Stanford provide the resources and education for the Rome team, but Stanford Linguistics has become a partner to Rome in creating this first class event. So much of the new world of healthcare is about interdisciplinary innovation, and this event is the perfect example of that. Combining the energy of a startup, the resources of a leading university, and the most cutting edge research, we have the hope of creating a better healthcare system for our country and the world. Thank you for all your time, and I hope to be there with you in person next year. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Orzag. Good morning, everyone. We're really excited to get started. Uh, we have a star-studded panel to talk about uh, the influence and uh, effects of AI in healthcare. I would immediately say that if uh, Rome Analytics algorithms in healthcare are as effective as its algorithms in getting the single most effective person to ask each speaker to appear, they're going to do quite well because uh, they have done a fantastic job in getting uh, people here. So uh, I'd like to get started. We're going to have our uh, panel come out. Um, their bios are in your uh, in the program, but uh, if I could have the panelists join me here. Peter, okay, we'll go with Bill. Bill is a senior fellow at the Harvard Business School and the former uh, CEO of Medtronic. Peter is the chairman emeritus of Nestle. George is the CEO of the Institute for Intergroup Understanding and the former CEO of Kaiser. Uh, Omar is the current CEO of Medtronic. And DJ is the former chief data scientist for the United States of America. Uh, so we have a illustrious group and an important topic. The title is, Will, I D Will AI Define the Healthcare Industry of Tomorrow? Does anyone think the answer to that is no? <laughs> okay, that was easy. Um, why don't I just briefly start with George. George, you believe we are on the cusp of a great new age. Before we get to some of the challenges, why don't we lay out the, the vision of what that great new age might look like. So can you just briefly tell us why you're so excited about what's happening? Uh, we are definitely on the cusp of golden age for healthcare because healthcare is a data-based uh, industry business profession and we are about to have access to more data than we've ever had access to data in better and more convenient ways. And we're going to have complete data about all of the patients, all of the diseases. We're going to have more information about the progression of disease. We're gonna have the ability to connect data for each patient. We're gonna have the ability to have doctors who interact with patients, have all of the information about the patients. Right now, we live in medical silos. The doctors have incomplete, unconnected information. They don't have the current science. They are far behind in, in many aspects of technology. And we're about to catch up. We're about to catch up on the science. We're going to catch up on the connectivity. We're going to catch up on care plans. We're going to have patient-centered care data. And that patient-centered care data is going to transform care. And we're going to have much better medical science because medical science right now, the inconsistency right now that exists in American healthcare is, is incredibly painful. And on top of all of that, the payers are changing. And what we're going to have, the, the old model is to buy every piece of care by the piece. 
And in a piecework model, you do not get innovation. You, also, you get all of the wrong incentives. You actually are rewarded for bad outcomes, bad consequences, bad health. And we are about to begin buying care by the package and redistributing. So all of Medicaid is about to become uh, system-based. Medicaid is flipping over. Medicare is transitioning into a Medicare Advantage plan where the plans are paid by the uh, patient by the month, not by the piece for care, and that really transforms care. And the rest of American healthcare is being uh, supported by large systems. And one of the largest systems, United Healthcare alone, has 120 million lives now. And they have Optum, and Optum is an incredibly competent data processing organization. So if you're a United Healthcare patient right now and you are in Kansas City and you're diabetic and you didn't fill your prescriptions, they know that. Nobody knew that before. That's the type of information that wasn't known. So Kite's permanent in my old plan. We compute really quickly, but we computerize everything. We we put in electron medical records and then we computerize every other aspect of care and there is no data, there's no paper inside KP. But all of the data on each of the patients is available to all of the doctors all the time. So we cut the stroke death rate by 40%. And we did it in part by focusing on each patient, identifying what the care plan is. And inside the rest of the, I'll end with this, but the rest of the country has on uh, hypertension, 40% of the patients under control. KP has 80%. And the reason KP has 80% is because we have data, because we have systems, we have information about the patient. Somebody knows what the patient plan is supposed to be, and then they follow up on each patient. They communicate that information to the care team for the patient, and they do things to change care. So it is possible to transform care, but you have to have somebody who's getting the cash flow of care interested in that transformation. And right now, hospitals make a lot of money on asthma crises. They make no money on preventing them. Okay, so, so, so owning, owning the lives and uh, having the data are two crucial pieces, but yes. uh, DJ, let me go to you, because uh, I think you might share the optimism of what, what's possible, but be more skeptical about how much the pace of change. So why don't you tell us about uh, why that is? Sure. So the, the most interesting to me, thing to me is like, the technology's here, it's just actually not in healthcare. Uh, at, at the pace at which you'd expect. You know, take the example of this pace and sophistication of technology that happens in an autonomous vehicle and the pace of iteration that we're seeing that's just literally driving around the streets here in Palo Alto. And why don't we see that pace and clip of specifically the technology getting implemented into healthcare? And I think there's a lot of reasons for the challenge. Uh, very much agree with the aspect that the data is becoming increasingly available. It is still, uh, the large research sets are getting available. It is still all too difficult for a patient to still get access to their data. Mm -hmm. And even worse is, it is it's nearly impossible for data to go from one system to another system in, uh, in a way that is usable. It's oftentimes a file that you get, but it's not actually a usable file, like in the same way that we think of, of getting a, a, a piece of information going from UPS to Amazon to tell you exactly where uh, your package is. There's another part in there is that the vendor solutions that have been implemented here do not have the pace of evolution that you typically see and are expected with companies that are around the valley in many ways. Uh, 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 in that case, uh, the pace and in innovation, many of the things are just layered on rather than rebuilt in brand new ways. And so if you just look at yesterday's announcements out of uh, Google I.O.'s event and the fact that voice recognition and machine learning and AI is so good it can get you a reservation by just talking to it, yet you can't book your appointment with a physician without going through some crazy IVR system, there's a real big shift. And By the way, if you haven't listened to that, go online and listen to the two examples that Google posted. It's amazing. That's right. It's about at the hour and 11 minute mark, I think, if I, if I remember right. Uh, <laughs> not that we keep track of these things. Uh, but but the, the, it's just, I just want to put that as a, as a more intentional, provocative layer, because I think there is incredible innovative stuff happening, but how do we drive that technology to actually radically disrupt clinical care now? 
rather than over the, the long arc. And I, and I fundamentally believe we can do substantially more. And Peter, you and I got to do a bit, a bit of this in the previous administration. The Precision Medicine Initiative that President Obama announced launched as of Sunday to create the large scale data sets that can enable and power research. But what's the time and pace for that research to get driven around in a direct clinical care? That's a fundamental challenge that still exists. So Omar, let me go to you, and, and also let me just mention, uh, we want to make this interactive, so I don't know if there are mics, but if there are not ni mics, uh, you can um, scream. Um, so uh, if questions arise, we're not going to wait for the question and answer period. Just raise your hand and we'll work you into the, the flow discussion. Um, Omar, uh, coming back to the owning the lives and the payment environment, I know you've been focused on the evolution away from fee-for-service, how that interacts with technology and the use of uh, analytics in, in healthcare. Share your perspective on where we are and where we could be. Well, a, a number of things. You know, first of all, um, there is technology evolution and in many ways pretty disruptive in healthcare therapies in many ways, either using technology or with pharma. I mean, people's lives are being extended Diseases are being cured, all kinds of things are happening. Uh, however, uh, the way in which these technologies are valued today are based on a promise that an outcome will improve. That promise is grounded based on uh, clinical research and publications, but nonetheless, it's a promise. Uh, to move these things more quickly, one has to create a system where the outcome is indeed the endpoint and uh, all stakeholders get incentivized for reaching a certain outcome. In that way, the technology progression uh, can happen more quickly. But therein also lies the problem, because I can say that you'll get paid for an outcome, but let's think that through. The first thing you're going to define is what is the outcome? And it has to be in a way that you actually get paid for it. So you get paid for an improved outcome, so what do you need to do? You need to first retrospectively baseline the current outcome using the data that you have. And then you need to have a system through which you can prospectively monitor the future outcome. Only then you can look at the difference in value and get paid for that. The next question you'll then come up against is, well, how many variables are there in achieving that outcome? If it's a one-to-one -one relationship between the technology and the outcome, that's one thing. That's a company like us can almost guarantee that. If the capability to measure and baseline outcomes exist, but there are other situations where the outcome is dependent on a variety of stakeholders. The, the physician, the hospital, the, the discharge <clears throat> instructions, a whole series of other things. Believe it or not, to set up a system where such collaboration is possible is today not even possible because of anti-kickback regulations, because of stark rules, because these are, are impediments in the way of creating a system where everyone is accountable for what they want to be accountable for. So I think we're going to work all of this. I think a lot of data does exist, which even today, which can be channeled for this purpose. I think clearly interoperability and standardization and longitudinal length of data, all of that, there's room for improvement, continued improvement. But I'd argue that there's enough today to get started. Uh, start with the simple things where technologies and outcomes are linked correctly and with no other variables, and then move on to more sophisticated areas. Uh, but we do need a uh, comprehensive, collaborative effort to do this. And let's go to uh, stay on the Medtronic theme for a second, go to the former CEO. Uh, mm -hmm. Bill, you also uh, do a lot of work in leadership. So we've got this rapidly advancing uh, set of analytics and technology, but also quite human systems into which <laughs> it's going to be uh, imported and used. Uh, how do you see the healthcare organizations responding to potentially quite dramatic changes in analytics and where, where, where are the examples of uh, organizations and systems that are incorporating the advances most effectively? Yeah, with a few, a few exceptions, it's a disaster. And <laughs> I thought it was interesting, DJ, you pointed out autonomous vehicles. That's wonderful because there are no humans involved. This is basically a human problem and the first question you have, it's a systems problem as well, and we haven't approached it as a system, as, as a true systems problem. But first of all, who owns all this data? Do I own my data as a patient, or does George own it? Uh, when he was at Kaiser, 
you know, I think we have to get to that fundamental problem. Do I have access to all my information? I just don't mean my insurance claims and all that, the insurance company. I mean, who has all my clinical notes that the doctors are taking? And I think we've got to address that question. And because, second of all, you, all of what you're talking about, you're not talking about a health care system. You're talking about a disease care system, mm -hmm. okay, where we treat people when they get sick. If we don't address that problem in the United States, our health care is going to get progressively worse uh, until we just totally hit the wall because we spend more money and the health gets worse. So you, you don't have a, but you've got to then make, we talk about patient-centered care. We don't have patient-centered care. The patient is an outlier and we treat the patient instead of giving the patient the opportunity to decide what they want to do. So how are we going to solve that problem? I do think that we have to have fully integrated patient data. George, you created a wonderful system at Kaiser, kudos, best system in the United States in terms of having all the information in one place and, you know, you also represent the, uh, if you will, the, the payment side. So you have a fully integrated system. So congratulations to you. And I think we need more systems like that that can look at it that way. Uh, Mayo is working hard towards this in selective geographic areas where George and I are both on the board of uh, Mayo, Peter. And, you know, for instance, we're working with Optum Labs, part of United Health, and we have now 50 million depopulated patient data, but we really have to be sensitive to patient confidentiality. And with HIPAA, and I think systems like United Health are doing a very good job on that, but we can't just throw it open to the IT companies that aren't sensitive to those issues because that data, if it ever gets out, is a, a complete disaster. If you have an Equifax situation, you can't. That's intolerable. And so that's why I think the, having the patient have access to their data, Peter, and having control of it, and getting leaders that think in a more integrated context, like the people at Kaiser do, like we're trying to do at Mayo, and bringing together the claims data and the patient data, the doctor's notes and everything else, and then making that available to the patient with fully, fully available cost and pricing data. There is no transparency in this system at all. No one knows what anything costs. And so that's why people overuse the system. So we have to address these fundamental systems problems, and we need leaders that think in that context to bring things together to an integrated system and get the patients so they are centric. Now, let's not overlook the tremendous potential that George is talking about with personalized medicine. I mean, I, I just think it's ridiculous that less than half of the chemotherapy administered to people, and you all know the ravages of chemotherapy. My wife went through it. Less than half of it, it works in less than half of the time. Right. That's totally unacceptable. Yep. We've got to be able to target the right therapy for the patient. Yep. I mean, if you had any kind of business where you had a less than a 50% success rate, it's not baseball. And so, you know, they need, we need to address those kinds of problems to use the data that is out there so we can target. But I think that is the golden age that George is talking about. So we know so much more about you. And we but it cannot, start, it cannot start when you come into the doctor's office or the hospital. It's got to start with your whole life. Because until that data is incorporated, Omar is trying to look at this. And I think the best place to do this is chronic disease. Omar, and going back to my era, tried to look at this in terms of heart, heart failure. We should look at that whole patient and treat them throughout their lifetime. And it should be, you know, we should have a payment system that takes that into account and enables them to stay healthy, not be bounced back into the hospital system all the time. So I think we can start with chronic disease, whether it's diabetes, whether it's heart, cancer, hips, knees, spine, all these diseases that have long-term high-cost consequences and neurological diseases, but having the patient have access to a full record and having interoperability of systems. Until we solve the interoperability problem, we will not be able to overcome this. So we've got to solve the basic data systems problems, not just having the data available. Okay, before I bring in Peter, actually, I want to just, uh, I, I saw uh, this uh, same question asked recently in a different forum, and I, w I want to do it here too, just on the, the question of who owns your data. So uh, there are, as you all know, multiple health-related apps that are now uh, available, and one question we'll get to is how to integrate them with uh, HIPAA compliant, um, more formal health data. But raise your hand if you have at least one health related app on your phone. Okay, keep your hands up. Raise, keep your hand up if you know exactly what happens to the data inside of that app. 
Exactly. <laughs> so th there is an issue. Oh, DJ kept his hand up, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that. Uh, there is an issue, even for the non-HIPAA data, on what's happening to your health-related data that we're going to come back to. But Peter, I want to I want to turn to you because one of the points that uh, uh, George uh, Bill made was that. Um, Autonomous vehicles are different because people aren't involved. And one of the distinctions that you have raised involves whether AI is used purely for algorithmic decision making or whether at the end of the day there is a human who then takes the results and interprets them. There was a Harvard Business Review article out yesterday on exactly this topic because the AI algorithms will come up with uh, diagnoses that the doctors may not fully understand why, you know, why is this variable driving that diagnosis? So uh, will we be entering a superhuman world in which uh, we just say, ah, the computer says it's okay, that's the diagnosis, we're gonna go with that? Or is there always going to be a human overlay in medicine and then it brings us back to the difficulties of that human overlay? Yeah, I think, um when we are talking about artificial intelligence, I think we have to, to, to get our mind clear. Are we talking about a tool for the human intelligence, which can enhance, which can even make your, our intelligence bigger? Or are we talking about an external intelligence, which has nothing to do with human anymore? Both ways, I think, are open, okay? Um, but it's very difficult, it's very different. On, on the outcomes that we will have. And the outcomes will be not only uh, for the individual, it's the outcome of the society we are going to do. As long as we are using uh, AI for uh, our intelligence, the human intelligence, it is a very, very strong tool which is not being exploited very clearly. Uh, it offers enormous opportunities um, as a businessman, I am always surprised about the enormous inefficiency of the American sickness system, as uh, <laughs> really Bill pointed out very clearly. I mean, you're spending almost 17% of GDP. You're the highest spender by far in the world, and you are one of the lowest in efficiency, in medical efficiency. You are somewhere on 47, 48. I mean, with many developing countries have a higher uh, health efficiency that the United States have, which by itself for a businessman clearly indicates that there is enormous room for improvement. And I believe that AI can be very helpful. The question was going to be later on is, once you start to use AI, what technology is already here, you, you mentioned that. Technology is here, it's just they have to be implemented. The question is going to be, when in this process you're going to allow AI to become the external intelligence? That was the question you were raising. When we are going to say, okay, now we get the diagnostic, which by the way, I think it's one of the weakest points in the American health system. I don't think you spent sufficient money into the diagnostic, you are wrongly diagnosing people, therefore you, have, you, are, you are putting <laughs> extremely expensive, extremely expensive treatments on, 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 on a very cheap diagnostic. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, okay? spend more in good diagnostic, and then afterwards you will have to spend much less in the treatment. So that's one area. But there comes to the point where you will get the result of, of AI, and you will have to make a decision, let I make the machine make the decisions, or will it be still the doctor who will make the decision, okay? And this will separate, because once you go into this direction, we are, we are Losing, we are going from an intuitive decision making, which is proper to the human beings, mm -hmm. to an associative decision making, which is a characteristic of the external uh, intelligence. This will be the important thing because it will separate clearly the society. And it will bring up one question 
which at least I have in my mind all the time. When are we going not to be human, not to be human beings, okay? <laughs> because, I mean, here sitting somebody talking about hips, knees, and things like this. Today, we already can recognize, okay, most of us have different hips and different, have artificial things like this, okay? We already cyborgs a little bit in this sense. <laughs> now we are talking about an artificial heart, which is also reality. Now there you start to, to get into emotional aspects. Is an artificial heart the same thing that the human heart? Mm -hmm. Is it? Is it not? So when are you going to decide, or when the society is going to decide that we are going to have we are not anymore human beings because the decision making is external, it's done by machines. We, our body is not going to be 100% human anymore. What does it need? So I think this will be one of the biggest questions that will come up, but this is after the healthcare system has really learned to use AE in order to get to much better uh, diagnostic, to get put more emphasis on, on, on the preventive part of it, because the system you have today, you will not be able to afford it. There's no doubt for me. And it separates, the system you have today separates the society into clear, clearly two extremes. Yeah. Those who can afford, okay? And I have my own experience, okay? One million dollar, if you want to save your life, or those who cannot afford, which is a big opportunity. So this system, I think, is a, is, a, is a really divide for society. Therefore, it's not sustainable in the long term. You know, I agree with you on just one quick point. Intuition. I agree with you, but I think the AI is going to give us a much better database on which yes. to make yeah. intuitive decisions. You can't make good intuitive decisions unless you have good data on which to right. make them. But you'll never take the intuition of a doctor uh, and understanding when, when he or she is doing surgery or making a diagnosis, that is a key part, but it's built on a much better base of data. Sorry but, yeah, for the interruption. So I, I wanted to, and, uh, let me bring in Omar, but yeah. let me just ask, I, just to kind of pin this down, let's go out, I don't know, 2025. What share of diagnoses slash clinical decisions do you think will n not involve the extra intuition human factor of a doctor overlay on whatever AI algorithms. Will there be a significant share of medicine that does not involve basically some doctor uh, <clears throat> judgment? Does anyone think there's any? Uh, let me no. know. I'll, I'll, no. Go ahead, George. Okay. Go ahead. You go ahead, George. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll quick I, I think we are a relatively short distance away from having machines doing the majority of the diagnoses and the majority of interpretations, and the majority of the scans, and that the doctors are going to be a support process to that, and will help the patient in the end decide what to do about the information. But there are, there are no doctors who are as smart as any of the computers. And so you're gonna get better diagnoses, better treatment, better treatment plans, everything from the machine than you get now from the doctors. The doctors are, are it's going to be important to have doctors in the loop to be sitting down with a patient and interpreting what the machine has just told the both of them because you have to make human decisions about how we're going to deal with this. But in terms of the, doc, the machines can identify breast cancers faster, they can identify the scans better, they can identify, I mean, one, one of the, the pieces of data that, that we discovered was that um, when a mother has a uterine infection during pregnancy, her children are far more likely to have childhood asthma. Okay, KP has complete database, so we have the database on the childhood asthma, have the database on each of the mothers, each of the treatments, and then we sorted that and identified that, uh, we broke it by race, and identified that African-American women are three times more likely, children more likely to have cancer, white mothers twice as likely, and, and Hispanic, or Asian mothers not at all. Okay. But what that did was it told us now we can look at each of the mothers and we can identify which ones had that infection. And because they had that infection, we can do things to prevent that infection in the kids 
and you can actually change their life significantly because childhood asthma can do a lot of damage. And so that's a kind of, there's no way you could figure that out without a computer. Think about all those parts and pieces. You had to have computer data and computer analytics and computer coaching, and then somebody has to deal with that information, take it to the mother and the child. But the, so I, I think that we are a very short distance away from having that be highly computerized. I don't know, I, I think, uh, look, there's no doubt that analytics and uh, the usage of data, the processing power, uh, will continue to increase over time. Uh, to pull a physician out of the loop today, though, and even in yeah, my view, in the, the loop, but yeah. even the foreseeable future, I think, is, is unlikely, uh, partly because um, I think machines have to continue to learn and grow and provide better and better insight. Uh, but that is a continuously evolving process. I, I, I think as, with time, that will increase. But, but I do want to, at least the way we think about it, I look at it in different sort of categories. The general discussion here has been about I'd say slow time data. That means data generically about, about patients, about their characteristics, about different cohorts and how you treat them, what the care pathways are, and giving input to physicians uh, to make them better at treating these, the, 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 these patients. For that, you need all the things that we talked about. I think if, if you shift slowly, usage of data towards behavioral data, which uh, talks about uh, patients' uh, eating habits, their weight, and all kinds of other things that they would, uh, they would input. That is a little more dynamic, that changes over time, that's added data to the general classification of genetics and history and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's a little quicker time data. And then you have real-time data, which are data from sensors, from products that we have that yep. are coming out all the time. Yep. Yep. I'd argue, in fact, is in place today and will accelerate even more quickly is the usage of AI in real-time data. Yes. Because real-time data is much more localized. We already use uh, fairly sophisticated algorithms yep. in our current products, yeah. which use uh, things like, uh, you know, motion, um, uh, the velocity of blood flow in the heart, and through that automatically change pacing algorithms. Uh, and, that, and that is further being modified by the habits of an individual. And so the pacing algorithm that may change in me versus somebody else may well be different because of my habits. Yep. These things weren't possible before. So I think slow time data aiding real time data to make intelligent decisions are probably the quickest way uh, and the one that's making the most progress. I think you'll also get machine learning in that way, in the sense that, that the, these devices and other, uh, other uh, products will, will in fact uh, tune to specific individuals and their behaviors. Uh, and, and I do think that these things should go on and should be encouraged to go on, and, and while interoperability and all of that I think are important to give even better classification of patients, that's not a, a, a brick wall today. We can, we can work with what we have. And, and, and make progress in, in that direction. All right, I, I saw some hands go up. I was wondering when that was gonna start, so let's, uh, let's start to work in the audience too. Lots more to discuss up here. So I was curious, in addition to kind of healthcare analytics, um, the role of machine learning and robotics mm -hmm. uh, in healthcare and surgery in particular. Yeah, well, sure. do you want me to take that or? Yeah. Uh, I, well, I think, uh, look, uh, robotics, uh, in surgery uh, is uh, going to become more and more prevalent. Yeah. There's no question about it. Uh, in fact, um, it, will, um, it will speed up minimally invasive surgery because of the uh, positioning that you can do with robots that manually uh, is probably gonna be more difficult. However, it's going to be, um, and it's gonna probably um, um, uh, sort of standardize the, uh, the, the, the outcomes more precisely. In other words, there'll be less variability with, with the robots. To expect improvement in outcomes over what we have today on, a, on an overall basis is something we have to prove. I don't think that's been proven yet. But I do think that robotics uh, will move uh, pretty quickly. And there's many aspects of data all the way from uh, image recognition to planning software to uh, actual uh, usage of uh, real-time data while you're doing the procedure yep. using um, you know, things like um, you know, vascular structures and so on while, while you're doing surgeries and the robot automatically knowing that. Uh, I think we're in the early phases of this, very early phases of this. The, the visualization methods will, will be revolutionized, uh, but I can easily say in this case, you know, 10, maybe 20 years from now, uh, the 
I, you know, a, a large number, let's say, of surgeries will be done through robots. Mm -hmm. You know, Peter, one thing that I think that's useful or, uh, as an example is there's a lot of times when we think about AI and machine learning, data science, and all the other buzzwords, is like, where's the biggest impact going to happen? Where's the big thing? So we, we asked that, that question with Secretary of Defense Ash Carter for the, uh, the entire Department of Defense. And we said, where is the biggest disruption going to happen? So we put a team together of a few people that we thought might know something. Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn, Eric Schmidt, uh, president of Alphabet, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, Jen Palka, Code for America, and a few others. We said, yeah, have at it. Go across the whole Pentagon and see where it is. And what we found is everyone thinks, oh, it's going to be weapon systems and all this stuff. It's the most boring problems. It's all the boring problems where you see the greatest disruption. How do I change supply lines? Where do I stage batteries? And so one of the things I think it's important to emphasize is we often look for the sexy problems in medicine, healthcare, or any other space where AI is going to happen. It's the super boring stuff. In banks, the disruption that's happening across automation and AI is in the back office because one person takes a piece of paper and hands it to another person, and it has very little judgment. It has just the ability of process flow. That stuff is where the huge lift will happen in the next five years. Over 40 years, we will have the current arc of evolution of AI is that a computer will be better than an arbitrary human at any task. That is the current assessment of, of the whole field overall. That doesn't mean that the systems will be in place to replace people. In fact, what it should be doing there is to augment people, but then getting rid of this kind of yucky crap work that, that is sort of back office and is just, frankly, uninteresting grunt work. So are you saying we should take an incremental approach rather than trying to solve the systems problems? What you're talking about are incremental things. These are, you're describing tools, let's attack this problem, that problem, that problem. Do it incrementally? Or do we have to address some of the fundamental system problems? I'm trying to understand. I, I think there's two parts. So the system level part is most of the time when we talk about data, we just talk about data access or data portability. That is necessary but not sufficient. So for example, like if you're trying to figure out when you buy a package on Amazon, your favorite e-commerce, and you want to know where that package is, those systems are interop. They're like, when we say interop, they are really interacting with acknowledgments, system backbacks, all these type of things, versus just access to data. Our architecture across healthcare doesn't actually allow for true system interoperability. It right. is just pure accessibility, and, and that allows for population health and other things, but not clinical care. So I think we have to look at that arc of what does a system architecture start to empower, and parts of that will happen in different pieces. The other part there, is inside which components are we allowed to, are we gonna see dramatic change that will happen where machine learning and other systems can happen. And a good example of this, I think, is in overall care delivery for cancer. And what does that look like? And for, uh, as part of the cancer moonshot approach, we took a look across these systems and we found everything from devices all the way through other s data sets are fragmented and locked up, whether by vendors or other systems. And there is a fundamental view that this should be a patient's data. Yeah. And that is going to happen whether we like it or not. And Europe is going to be on the front leading edge of that, whether it's consumer data with uh, GDPR or anything else. That shift is coming. Uh, and that is, that is something we should embrace. The other part, though, that, that is in there is we found that fundamentally for those big innovations to happen is where do we, does the work actually happen? Does it happen within this silo, this silo, or do we need a new platform on where this is happening? And that's part to your going to your question also of large scale systemic change. And, and we, have to, we don't know what that looks like. Is it the Google Cloud? Is it something else? Is some, uh, we don't know. And I think there's ample opportunity for that, that to come together for something novel. So DJ, just on, uh, on uh, owning your own data, right. having access to it, because that is changing. Actually, I get a curious, let's again uh, involve the audience. How many of you have your electronic health record on your phone or on your computer? In other words, you, you have, it's about a quarter maybe. So I guess specifically, what needs to happen so that that quarter becomes, assuming everyone would like it on their phone or wherever, <laughs> uh, becomes 100%. What is the impediment today that is getting in the way. Yeah, so there's a few pieces in there. The first is that why do you actually need your data on your phone at all? 
You just need authorization for your data to move. Most of the time we say, hey, you want access to your data. Maybe you want access to your data from a pacemaker or an MRI. Do you want the real zero and ones? Probably not. <laughs> you want some image or some way that data could be used. And we don't know how to actually make that usable. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time people always go and say, hey, I want my Facebook or LinkedIn data. And you're like, for what? We can give it to you, but do you want all the terabytes? For, for what purpose would you want? Uh, if it's an email system, sure, you want the addresses so you can use it somewhere else. The other part there is we need to have the platforms to, to, to figure out like what are we trying to do. And so like an example of this very concretely is a program we stood up called Sync for Science, which works with hospital systems as well as Epic, Cerner, and all the other vendors to say, hey, what is a common format to put this data in so it can be moved for research or for other platforms? And we need to see more applications of where this is actually benefiting a person. We ha now have a premise that this should help you, but we don't have the concrete realization of this is actually how it's going to materially help you if you have your data. Right. All right, we have a, uh, I, th I think there was another question here, and then there's one uh, couple rows back, so. Yeah, hi, uh, Lee Sanders with Pediatrics and Health Policy. Um, I'm not concerned about AI replacing me, and I'm, I'm not concerned about um, robots un being able to hold my patient's hands or cry with them, but I do see the opportunity for AI to address health disparities. Um, one in three adults has difficulty with health literacy, one in 10 in this country with limited English proficiency. And um, back to DJ's points about the boring problems, um, the biggest problem in my office here in Silicon Valley is fax machines getting in the way of unmet health needs for my patients. So I'm kind of curious about what, the, what you guys think are the opportunities for AI to finally eradicate some of these intransigent health disparities based on socioeconomic status, ethnicity, et cetera. I can give a concrete example. Sure. So we started a program about seven years back called Crisis Text Line. It's, uh, it's uh, texting in, and if you, have, uh, if you are suicidal or self-harm, you can get access to help in real time. It, it relies on all volunteer network that, that go through training. And part of it is to address this challenge of people in need of help. We save about 20 people a night. And part of the way that system works is it's built completely ground up using the same technology you would find in uh, any, pick your favorite label of a consumer internet company. But because we're able to use natural language processing on the front end, we're actually able to identify patterns very quickly. So for example, if you use the word Tylenol or Advil or anything at the very beginning of, a, of, a, of, a, uh, of one of those text messages, depending on the situation you're in, you're somewhere between four and 16 times more likely to, to be in the act of committing suicide when you type that, when you type that text. And so we can then dynamically try to get, a, 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 try to get enough information to route a hospital or, or uh, um, of an ambulance to you right then or a care team. So similarly, the other one is that, that's there with uh, technology and disparities, I think, is, is going to start getting to what do clinical trials look like and how do we actually build out more comprehensive clinical trials and platforms to include making sure it's not just classically middle-aged white males that are in the program, but to broader uh, aspects. I think I saw a tool uh, somewhere in the audience. The tool's there. He's working on a bunch of this over at UCSF and other places. So I think there's actually a great opportunity here, but there's also an incredible challenge that data can be used to marginalize populations, particularly those of different ethnic groups, and we've seen that happen historically. Uh, and there's real issues around that with disparity happening right now. The criminal justice system is a specific example where we are using data currently to marginalize populations. So I guess uh, let me just br uh, bring in all of you, and we've got, a, we've got a, another question in the back. Uh, that all sounds great. But we still haven't really dealt with the question of what I'll call unauthorized access to my data. How do I know where and when it's being used? And obviously, that's come up in other domains. Uh, do you mean like by the Chinese government? Uh, well, mine's already. You know, <laughs> they have all of them. <laughs> they uh, have both of them. Yeah. Anyone who served in. Uh, <laughs> Depends well, what type of auth unauthorized. They want yeah. To go down. No, I, I meant uh, just as we widen out the potential applications uh, that are used based off of your data, 
how do we make sure that patients are the ones ultimately deciding? And if we don't do that, are we going to have the same kind of backlash that we're seeing in some parts of social media? Yeah, I think it's a huge problem. I think that you, there have to be, you know, we have laws, the HIPAA laws, if anything, are way too restrictive, but they are a law of the land, and so you can't just throw, I can throw my stuff out into social media, but the hospital can't. They hardly can share with another hospital without my authorization. So I think we get to this core issue that the patient's going to have to be the control of their own data. And I think we haven't addressed that problem yet, but I think we have to go there. Uh, I think that's ultimately got to be the solution. The patient has control of their data, unlike your example of Google, unlike the case of Facebook where you're turning over control over your information to someone else. So I think we're going to have to do that. So how does that then interact? And if I put it out into the public right. sphere, then I have to suffer the consequences of that. And how does that just inter uh, interact with the desire to be combining multiple different data sets and the, uh, you know, the analytical insight that we get from? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think it's going to require, Peter, authorization. So, yes, and we, should, we have to make that authorization now. It's way too complex. Very simple. You know, if I see a primary care doctor in Minneapolis, I authorize Mayo to have access to that data and vice versa. And I think, but we don't have common systems, so we're a long way from getting to that. So we have so many disparate systems that they don't share that information. And again, we're just talking about disease information. We're not talking about my health. We're talking about my disease information. And so I think we have to get to the full health record and information. So it, otherwise it becomes a one-off situation. But yeah, I think this is a huge problem. We've got to get to interoperability of systems. And we got to require that. I mean, that's the beauty of a lot of the things on the internet. I think we're going to see a little bit of an arms race going on between the health plans relative to accessibility of data. Mm -hmm. The Optum of, of the world, Aetna's, basically see that they're, they add a huge amount of value by having all of the diagnoses and procedures, the uh, information about each patient available electronically to each patient who's a customer of theirs. And that database can be used with some of the new apps in some very creative ways. And they're going to be competing with each other to do the best job. And as a country, we're at the point where pretty much every single state is turning Medicaid over to health plans. And Medicare itself, as I said, is moving to Medicare Advantage. And that's all health plans. And all of those health plans compete on making the data available to the patient. So I think we're seeing a payer competition to do the best job of getting that information to the uh, customer, to the patient, and that does not involve the HIPAA violations because it comes through that channel that makes an illegal sharing of information. So I, I think we're on, on, again, the cusp of the golden age of data sharing and that people are going to figure out how to use those apps most productively. And the health plans are also in the process of doing a much, much better job of telling people what things cost up front relative to their deductible. So if you're Aetna United <laughs> member and you have a um, $1,000 deductible, $2,000 deductible, you can go to their data sites and find what their providers are going to charge you for their office visit. And that, that type of, in, and that's also going to transform care because you're going to get competition on the office visit price, but also we're going to see many more e-visits. And we're now seeing a transfer uh, to the internet as a source of direct care delivery enabled by the process. So I, I think, again, that's going to happen much more quickly if we relied on the care delivery system to come up with a tool, it would never work. But the payers are going to put a tool out there that's going to work and they're going to put it out now and they're going to make it part of their competitive advantage. So why don't you just tell me the whole price? Why do I have to know the deductible? I know that that's just an insurance <clears> thing. Why shouldn't I know the whole price before I make a decision? Well, the cost the, yeah, of the, the whole procedure, the, and so I can look at the alternatives, you know? I think they're going to make price the, the price part that's relevant to you, but the total price that they pay, they're not going to make available because they don't even know at that moment. The United, they have so many different deals with so many different care providers, and the, the actual dollars are processed in the back end of the, of the cash flow that determines the exact price. But up front, the difference in an office visit, there are $40 office visits, $80 office visits, and $200 office visits that are the same office visit. And the only difference is which provider's door you go through. You should know that as a consumer. And the other thing is true is if your pediatrician's charging 200 bucks a visit, 
and you can go online to 20 good pediatric online services and get that for 20 bucks, a lot of mothers are going to go to the online version. So what we're going to see, I think, is a much more robust world there, but it's, it needs to be supported by the insurance companies getting that information to the patient. So if you wanted to know the importance of this, there's an uh, updated version of the paper from Zach Cooper and others at Yale on the variance in prices within employer-sponsored insurance. And what's astonishing is in this new version of the paper, which just came out yesterday, they look at the share of the overall variance in prices, which is the bigger driver of variation in employer-sponsored insurance than utilization across the United States. Yeah. Uh, the share of the variance that comes within the hospital. So for the same procedure within the hospital, the share of uh, price variation is a very significant, I think it was something like 20 or 30% of the overall price variation. So even within the same hospital, depending on who your insurance company is. Oh, more, more than 20. Yeah, massive double. amount of variation. Double. You know, I, I'm with Peter. This, to me, this is unacceptable yeah. that we accept it. I, I do. Think of any other form of commerce where we don't know the price of anything. How, you know, how yep. can you make a decision? If you ordered you a hamburger, the price of a drug when you, you get buy three it. prices. Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> if you ordered a hamburger and you got a different price every day for lunch. <laughs> I, I do but, think, look. But, you, you, you know, I, I don't get it, guys. I really don't. I think we got to, you know, this is the old system. I, I think, look, transparency well, is extremely important and clarity. But, but to have that, uh, let's, let's face some realities here. Yeah, uh, that's true. To, to price the care of a certain patient even if it's for the same treatment, depends on the starting point of the patient. The cost of managing a patient who's uh, 85 years old, have five comorbidities, going through a certain procedure, is going to be different than a patient who's 50 years old, who's got no comor comorbidities doing the same procedure. It's going to mm -hmm. be different. Mm -hmm. And we need to be transparent about that, but you can't equalize all pricing just by s oversimplifying this problem. I think the problem needs to be addressed. But we, we need to make sure we understand how to classify cohorts of patients. We need to be transparent about what it takes to do them. We need to improve these things over time. But, you know, we need to do this in a systematic way. And there's no magic wand that you can glue, sort of wand, wave over the whole thing and say that suddenly all prices are transparent and so we know everything that's going on. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Well, let me, I think there's a portion in there that gets to a very interesting question, yeah. especially around Medicare Advantage. Yeah. Because in Medicare Advantage, and we were talking a little bit about this earlier backstage, is if you're do building a Medicare Advantage plan, part of that is being able to price in that, that risk-adjusted basis. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So parts of the ecosystem are starting yes. to do that, yeah. but it's just scratching but that's, the surface. That's what I wondered, that you know, these things, that's why I started the discussion with the focus on outcomes, because the moment you want to uh, start to define an outcome, mm -hmm. because that's what everybody wants. No one's going to argue that a better outcome is good. No one's at the lowest cost. No one's going to argue about that. To achieve that, let's start with the outcome. Let's start with things that you can define. Mm -hmm. And then you work your way back to the cohort Absolutely. for whom that outcome can be defined. And so you've got to take this in stages. And then who are the players involved? Mm -hmm. And you know, you just got to kind of do this brick by brick. And th there is no like magic house that I can put over here. Uh, because they are different. But it can be done. You need a systematic approach towards this. Uh, and we need to be aligned. Because if, if people are not aligned, everyone to improve the outcome, but are aligned for some intermediate variable, you will not necessarily get the right outcome, get the right results. And, and so right we got now, a lot there of are different tiers of price. I mean, the, there is a, the lowest price at every site is Medicaid. Medicaid sets a price arbitrarily, and it's a very low price. 20%. The price, and then the price above that is Medicare. It's about 20% higher on Medicare. And then the price above that is whatever the commercial market Obair. is negotiated. And that depends on each contract, so that varies contract to contract. And then the price above that is price for people who have no insurance at all, and that's the highest price at all. So if you have yep. no insurance at all, you've got an extremely high price. And in the hospital world, that can be five, six times the Medicaid price. Yep. By the or way, the evidence, the, the evidence suggests that if, care. if you limited commercial prices to no more than 120% of Medicare for each procedure, overall employer-sponsored insurance spend would drop by 20%. Well, to uh, give you another quick number, the candidate right now uses the Medicaid fee schedule. The fee schedule we use for Medicaid is the same one they basically they use in Canada. And so they're at 11% of their GDP. If they flipped over just to use our Medicare fee schedule, not our Medicaid, they would go to 14% of the GDP from 11 overnight. Way in the back. You've been standing there patiently. Thank you. Yeah, Bob Foley from uh, QV Medical. 
have been working on breast cancer detection probably for the past 20 years. So the question to the panel is a bit of a shift from textual analysis to medical imaging analysis and to interject a little bit of real world to get approval through the FDA for one of our devices. We had to do 20,000 patients accumulating that medical data you know, over a two year period. So basically, if you have a product today in the imaging space, it's really gonna take one to two years to get through the regulatory process. So I'd like to have your comment on the medical imaging as opposed to textual analysis. Where do you think we're going with, uh, and how can we influence the regulatory decisions? Well, if I can offer, you, look, medical imaging will continue to progress. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you'll need to kind of, uh, and I, I think the use of uh, AI in particular and, and automated tools mm -hmm. in interpreting and, uh, and speeding up um, the diagnosis, the, the, the diagnostic process um, uh, will, will certainly be there. I think from a regulatory perspective, uh, y y I think the regulatory authorities are becoming more open to using like Bayesian analysis and other, other forms of st statistical analysis to be able to uh, uh, increase, improve the speed and, uh, of the approvals. Uh, you just gotta be a little careful that you don't get a free for all. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think you have to have strong uh, regulation uh, around, uh, around the subject. Otherwise, uh, you know, errors can happen which can have dramatic consequences. So the assurance of safety, I think, is important. I think efficacy, it depends on, um, once safety is assured, then it depends on what you're trying to replace and how much it costs and whether, whether it's worthwhile or not. Um, I, I do think medical imaging, though, is going to continue to evolve, and not only in diagnostics, but in, um, in, uh, in treatment during, during procedures, uh, having access to uh, images, uh, either pre-scanned or, or during the procedure, I, I think that'll become more and more prevalent. Mm -hmm. I'll give you two real quick. One is uh, uh, the, in the imaging space, we need to start thinking about it actually as a more collective whole, not just the image. We can think of it as a very flat static file versus the context around that file. And how do we make that a more comprehensive approach to, to the overall uh, uh, questions of evaluation. The second is the FDA really needs to be able to have pathways for increased technical talent to come in and help on this problem. One of the big challenges that you pointed out is if you're on a two-year regulatory approval process and you start to change the model because new models have come online, do you start back at square one or what's the other portion yeah. of update in there? And that regulatory process does not match the current pace that technology is on. And uh, the FDA needs help identifying and finding pathways for those type of technologists to come on and help make that a comprehensive approach with the, 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 the traditional models of regulatory. Yeah, and before we actually move on to the... Super slow, I yeah. So. Yeah, I, I sadly, I know more about this than I wish I did, because we tried to, we were part of the, trying to help Rob yeah. Califf at the time, trying mm. to get this going. And there's just an impedance mismatch between mm. Silicon Valley, <laughs> maybe, and, maybe. and the places. But, but if you look at where they've come from an incremental perspective, the Silicon Valley. The, the shift has been. I don't disagree yeah. with their shift. And maybe the goal should be even more even aggressive. More. But, yeah. but certainly, uh, uh, I've seen a, um, a pretty serious shift. Yes. In, in speed of approvals and so on. I agree okay. with. Can that. I ask before we move on though that on the on the other end of things, as we have this explosion of data, um, the real world evidence piece of this is going to be easier to uh, evaluate. We don't need to set up uh, individual, uh, individualized kind of platforms to study each uh, device or each imaging or what have you. you. As we move towards more comprehensive data, you'll have the ability to evaluate post-marketing what's mm -hmm. working and what's, what's right. not. So how much will mm -hmm. that change the regulatory regime Will we see a lot more phase four studies? Sort of what are the implications of having um, uh, a, a more kind of universal set of uh, health data that's integrated? I, I think that's happening. I, I think uh, there's already at least a, a desire 
to, uh, and I've seen that happen, uh, you know, sort of uh, speed up approvals uh, with, the, uh, with the commitment that post-market uh, uh, surveillance is done in a rigorous way with reporting to the FDA. And I think that's beginning to happen. I think with the, uh, with, with there, I think the utility of, uh, of longitudinal data and, and uh, more uh, comprehensive uh, data points um, will speed that up. Yeah, we, I, I certainly think that that's happening. We definitely need to do that. We, we need to, because you can get earlier approval that way, and we need follow-up data. By the way, hospitals yeah. need to do that, too. They need to follow up on their patients, yeah. not just when the patients come back. They need to know what happened. They need to look at total outcomes, and that should come into the total cost picture. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, I think that, you know, if they misdiagnose patients, there yeah. ought, there's no price for that today. Uh, there ought to be a penalty for that if they the patient complications. The FDA is trying to assess them on that back on the manufacturers, but I think it's got to go to the hospital. But I, I do think that I hope the path that we're on uh, is one where through poor surveillance um, activities, we, you know, because we find something wrong, we don't stop the process, but we quickly find out how to fix it. So if you, because the act of surveillance means that you're worried about something. That you're not, it's not going to be perfect. And you're going to find things. Yes. And when you find things, then we should act, uh, find a process through which we can fix them easily and take it to the next level. As opposed to say, hey, I'm too scared to do anything right now and go backwards. Right. So I, I think this has to be a continuously learning process, which is regulated in a, in a very uh, proactive manner. OK, we've got a question here, then we'll go there, and then in the middle. Uh, Ram Fish, 19 Labs. Um, Fascinating discussion, especially on the healthcare industry, or as one of you referred to it as the disease management industry. Um, but you pointed out three points. One is, um, this is more about disease data. The behavioral data is actually not something that the existing healthcare industry usually has access to. Two, healthcare is moving out of the clinic, out of the hospitals, into new places. And three, Healthcare industry has traditionally not been in technology industry. It's moving uh, in a polite way, in a very different pace than mm. Silicon Valley. And now we have at least two major players moving in, Amazon and Apple. So how do you speculate, and this is, let's say, asking you here to purely speculate, on how both of those companies will enter the space? They have the technology powers, they have the speed and agility, and they have the behavioral data. So what kind of world do you envision in the next three years when those two companies are moving in? Well, they clearly can deal with subsets of the problem. Like, we desperately need to disintermediate the entire pharmaceutical distribution process. So get from the pharmaceutical manufacturer directly to the consumer without passing through five hands and upping the prices and a lot more price non-transparency. So those things need to be done. But, you know, I'm, not, I'm skeptical about whether the primary care system is totally broken in the United States, in my opinion, and seven to ten minute appointments simply are not given enough time to diagnose, and there's no accountability and no responsibility for misdiagnosis. And so it's told. Totally, and I think you can see, Peter talked about income disparities as to DJ, and I think you can see a lot more of that moving into community and other resources. But we're going to have to give the patient the information they need, and a lot of the information is going to transfer there rather than being held in a secret place in the hospital. And I think that's got to happen first so that mm -hmm. patients can take responsibility. That's why I had a negative reaction to the idea that we can't provide them price transparency. I think we have to do that so they can make logical, intelligent decisions, have people around that can help them make those decisions. Other views on what Amazon or Apple will do? What's that? I said other views on what Amazon or Apple might do. I'm actually less interested in what they're doing versus what they're empowering through the platform. For example, specifically, that uh, there's two sides of this. One is they're going to be sitting on so much data, they can actually do work on problems that others just can't do. Uh, and, and so if you want to do machine learning or these type, type things, if you've, it's a question of how much data you get. <laughs> and if, you, if you're a new player and you don't have that data, you can't do certain things. The second is, is, as we've seen, like Netflix sits on top of Amazon's infrastructure. And so there may be a much more hybridized world that actually takes place. If you're a healthcare system and you're trying to develop your own machine learning algorithms, 
that's probably not a great investment right now, relatively using Google Cloud infrastructure or one of the other packages, because that, that, the, the, the pace of that technology is just improving so fast. So I think there's gonna may, it may be much more blended through different portions of the so-called stack rather than wholesale. But they don't have the clinical data. No, I, I'm, I'm referring to, not saying that they will maybe have the clinical data, but that you may see more partnerships as a result mm -hmm. where the, the, the platform is being leveraged. Here, I'll, put out, I'll put out one idea for people. I have no, I have no idea what they're going to do, but I'll put out one idea that I, I think, and just to get reaction to how they could get clinical data. So the Amazon JPM Berkshire thing, which is still sort of vacuous, um, could take the one point whatever million employees at those three companies, create a private portal mm -hmm. where right. you have your insurance choices, right. a bill payment function, right. a scheduling tool, all of which are actually, they have technical problems, but are doable. The ability to import your yep. electronic health record and your families yep. all into one place, make it work, which is not easy, but doable. And then as soon as it starts working, open it up to other firms. And instead of one and a half million yep. people, you got 30 million people. Yep. And then you're in the middle of lots and lots of transactions and you start going to the insurance companies and say, if you want to still be listed, you have to do X. To the payer, to the providers, if you want to still be paid through this mechanism, we're going to take a little bit. You've got electronic yes. health records. That strikes me as eminently this makes, possible. This makes infinitely good sense. The employers are not, they're fully self-insured. You know, they just use insurance companies as administrative vehicles. Right. And these employers, yes, should come together and they, they could drive the disintermediation, they could drive better pricing, and they could drive better record keeping for those patients. So that would be a subset where the problem, as you're describing it, in my opinion, could work very well. It doesn't deal with part of the population that have access to jobs and things like that, but it could work, in my opinion, very well. All right, there was uh, a question way in the back. Hi, uh, thank you for great discussions. Tatiana Kianzavelli, uh, CEO of Open Health Network. Uh, question for you. So we talk about AI in need of having uh, lots of data and hopefully clean data and integratable, analyzable data. At the same time, we um, create an environment where patient reported data is kind of collected via so many different venues that uh, it makes it impossible to include in analytics. I'll give you an example. My father, so he had heart attack, diabetes, hyper hypertension, and uh, depression. So in today's world, to collect data from him outside of the hospital or clinic, he would have to use like 10,000 apps and chatbots. And welcome to Wild West of Digital Health. So um, is there a need right now to stop this nonsense and what you think needs to be done to disrupt and actually bring to a common sense on what's happening in patient reported outcome collection and analytics with we know what we basically created a monster right now. Thank you. Well, Anyone? You know, that's a... <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I do think that, uh, th that zeroing in on some... Uh, accountability and ownership of patients and their state of health uh, is important. Uh, and then you, you've got to sort of, like I said earlier, you've got to categorize patients differently. I mean, the example that we just heard, um, you know, that, that person needs a certain care pathway that's different from someone who's only got diabetes, for example. Uh, and uh, you can't kind of mix and match the two. I really think a, a, a good way to identify cohorts and then follow through on that is one of the critical elements in healthcare. You know, remote patient monitoring has been around for a long time. And every time there's a study, it shows that remote patient monitoring does not save any money. Mm -hmm. that it's, and why is that? It's because we don't segment the patient population and provide remote patient monitoring to people who actually need them. Instead, we give it to everybody. And so the cost of providing this uh, monitoring outweighs the benefits that you get on people who actually need them. And so when you average the whole pool, you say it's not worth doing. And yet you apply common sense to this and you say, yeah, for this specific category, of course it's worth doing. And so separating this, the data that we have out into, into defined categories for whom standardized care pathways can be provided and outcomes defined is the essential element to standardize healthcare. 
And anything else, you know, you're trying to, you know, come up with too many solutions without figuring out the problem properly. So I do think you just take a step back and, and just, just kind of do this thing in an organized way. And we've got enough today to get started and, and, make, and move the needle today if we all get aligned around this process. All right, so we're, we're sort of getting towards the end. Um, what I want to do is collect a couple questions. So we're going to go there, there, and there are a couple over here. But before, before we do that, Peter, I want to bring you back in. You've run a large consumer-oriented business. Um, there's a big piece of this on the prevention and population health part that we've touched upon but not really delved into. So what, what could healthcare companies learn from other consumer-oriented companies and what else do we need to be doing to encouraging better behavior on the part of consumers? Uh, or as, as from a health perspective, I, really, I mean. Yeah, I think uh, the fundamental question uh, is going to be that uh, who is the owner of the data and who is willing to make this data available? But that's the same thing in a consumer good company. You have the same thing. We have a fantastic database, and it's being used, depending on, on also on the values that the company has, it's being used in different ways. Sometimes it's being used, I would say, abusively, and sometimes it's being really used in order to help uh, the consumer to make a better choice. You know, it's, 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 it comes back to value, who makes a decision. When, when, when you have, when you have uh, the humans involved, uh, humans are basically being driven by purpose and value. So you, the values will decide what, what you do with the data. And uh, when you are in the, in the other part of the, of the artificial intelligence, it's going to be driven by the amount of data and the quality of data. This is how you become more intelligent in the, in the artificial intelligence. So you, the artificial intelligence demands to have more data. When am I going to give my data? When I get the value for it? And I can tell you very clearly, if, if, if you are in an, in, in an issue and, 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 and the doctor in the hospital, and I don't know what, asking you for your data, you give it because you hope that with, by giving access to my data, I get something that will help me, sure. okay? Right. So I think this data and, and this data uh, discussion, which today uh, is a little bit still in the political uh, thing about uh, data privacy. I remember uh, living in Switzerland, there was one privacy that was as important than data privacy. It was a bank secrecy. Mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> the whole society was built, nobody could imagine. Well, today there is no bank secrecy anymore and the country still exists. <laughs> uh, and I will tell you one thing. I believe there is a day there will not be a data secrecy because it just will not work. You will have to give this data out to, to somebody else. So I think it is much more uh, the moral question and the value question about if we don't have a data secrecy, who is going to with which values and with which responsibilities are this data being used? Right. Is it going to be used for the good of the individual or it's going to be used for good for something else? That's a big question. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take four questions. So there's one, two, and there are two over here. We're going to go down uh, uh, the panelists up here. You can answer one or more, but just <laughs> in your good. final uh, remarks, and if you don't want to answer any of the four, I will ask one to make it five questions, which is, what is the single most, this, the single thing you are the most excited about over the next five or ten years in healthcare? So, uh, let's go here. here. We've got to just do this quickly, so right there. Okay, second question. Oh boy, okay. Uh, 
provocative statement that I would be interested in your response to, and that is that real, revealed preferences in the modern economy suggest that patients and people don't actually care about data privacy. Don't what? Okay. They, 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 they don't they actually people care, don't about care about They give away their data uh, privacy. So, so, yeah. you, so you mentioned that your data has been taken by the Chinese government and the breaches. That was um, not by choice. Yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> but, but still, we don't seem <laughs> upset about it, right? I don't the, remember that in the terms of service. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the Equifax <laughs> breach, right? How many of us opted out of the credit market, Facebook and so forth, that suggests that this obsession with privacy is actually a function of pre-digital policy makers who have sort of a, a late 20th century, even a 19th century philosophical yeah. So the question, are, are we just, are we worried about the wrong problem? People don't fr fundamentally care. Uh, let's pick up the two over yeah, here. I got it. Uh, Dick Levy, Varian Medical and Sutter Health. We all agree the technology is exploding and the information is exploding and there's a lot of difficult problems to getting them in sync. But one problem that I don't think has been addressed, I'd like to see addressed, is the fact that we've got technologies that's three years, five years, ten years old that is still not being used. We've got best practices that have been established that are still not being used. In cancer in particular, 50% of the treatments are not according to best practice. What do we do about that and how do we transition this to, to the low-hanging fruit, the boring part, it's not sexy, but it is the low-hanging fruit of how we can cure more disease. Okay, and final one. to making this data flow uh, across different platforms. How do we get there? Who owns that problem? Is it government? Or do you see it getting worse before it gets better, especially with wearables and sensors coming out? How do we make all these things talk to one another? Who owns it? Okay, so long-term incentives slash Medicare for all. Uh, do people even care? Uh, why don't best practices spread more quickly? And how do we get data to be integrated in two and a half minutes? I'm yeah. sure we can do this. I'll, I'll go 15 <laughs> seconds. So the, the, the quick is, I, I th think that people are actually going to care a lot more about privacy as harm starts to happen through the open data. People have not been harmed from the large breaches yet. Uh, that harm is coming. Uh, and so we'll see much more there. And then to the specific part of like, what did we do about the, the part? There's a lot of data that's out there and we've all kind of said like, there's a lot of low hanging fruit and we need to start really addressing that. And that is why the number one thing that I'm bullish on is broad based population health through these larger data sets uh, and new techniques being leveraged by some of the bigger players. Thank you, Omar. I think I'm going to answer the question, or at least attempt to answer the question, why best practices take so long to become standardized. And it's because no one's accountable to make them standardized. Because no one's really accountable to actually get to an outcome which leverages those best practices, and so they're not established. And I think there's a growing recognition of that. I think we need to be decisive in that move, and uh, we can't please everybody. Uh, but focus in on an outcome, and then best practices will indeed be adopted, because that's the only way you'll reach the optimum outcome. I think we're going to end up looking at the long-term uh, care of each individual person uh, sort of through the back door by having the entire country is going to have, everyone with insurance is going to have insurance from plans that have data that are using that data to figure out how to improve care and are creating relationships with caregivers, feedback systems, the Optum model of figuring out what is happening with each patient in Optum and what could be done to improve the care. Uh, United has now hired 40,000 doctors. They are the biggest medical group in the world and they're basically all primary care. And they are taking that model and they're identifying what needs to be done for each patient. Computers are supporting it. Then they're providing feedback through nurses and primary care doctors doing specialty contracts on the back end and the specialty contracts are putting out to bid based on who does the best job on cancer, who does the best job on each of the other specialty conditions. So we are for the first time creating a marketplace in this country where specialty care is gonna be competing based on data and primary care is gonna be computer supported. Aetna, the other payers, know that their future depends on them being able to clone this so they're rushing down the same path. So we're actually in the middle of a transition that's probably invisible to just about everybody in this room, but it's transforming the way cash flow for care is set up in America. And I actually think it's going to a really good place. I think that the results of this are gonna be better care. Peter. Well, I will try to give an answer for your question. You were <laughs> asking what, what I will be the most excited about. 
But I would, I would be the most excited about if the healthcare system would recognize that in order to have a long and healthy life, you have to have a very healthy nutrition. Mm -hmm. This is a door opener for health, and this is not being recognized at all. And it's a preventive part of it, and yet I think it's the most important part of it. So if we come to this, it's quite interesting that we have talked today oh, for hours and hours, but the word nutrition didn't come up once. Mm. Mm. And yet, the biggest death rate today of chronic diseases, all of them are related to nutrition. Absolutely, yeah. Seventy percent of our health care costs are tied up in unhealthy lifestyle. Four percent of our costs, our okay. research costs are spent okay. on. I'm going to answer your question, too. I think personalized medicine of all forms, both the yep. scientific yep. part of personalized medicine and I think the fact that I look at my whole health and take, can get all the data to help me live a healthy life, not just get fixed from disease, and I can operate with an integrated system. I think we're going to have to move to integrated systems. The disparate systems we have are not going to work. If we can have Kaiser Permanente model, model all over the country, frankly, I'm not trying to flatter George, we'd be a lot better off. But I can operate within a closed loop system. All right. Well, please join me in uh, thanking this fantastic panel. Thank you, guys. Ladies.